we have been looking at um, the three doxologies in the New Testament that begin with now to him who is able. That's really the whole series. Uh, well, we've been doing this entire series. Uh, there is one in Romans, there's one in Ephesians, and one in Jude. And so we have been looking at these doxologies. Uh, and if you remember, uh, a doxology is um, composed of two Greek words. The first word is doxa, which means glory, honor, or praise. The second part is logos, which means a word or a saying. So a doxology is a word of praise or a word of glory. In other words, it is the worship of God. That's really what we've been studying with these three doxologies in the New Testament. And so we have two main goals throughout this series. The first is this, that theology always leads to doxology. That doctrine always leads to devotion, that the study of the Word of God always leads to the worship of God. We saw that in Romans as Paul was just um, uh, going through some deep doctrine and theology in all of Romans, and how does he end chapter 16 in praise and worship to God? Same thing with Ephesians. The first chapters, 1 through 3 in Ephesians, are very doctrinal. Um, and then the rest of the chapters, the second half of the book, are very practical. And so theology for Paul and Jude uh, always led to doxology. So theology is not about, I'm just going to know more stuff, but it's about the worship of God. It's about uh, our affections and our love and our praise for God. That was the first goal that we wanted to see. And the second goal is that doxology is, itself is rooted in theology, that our worship of God is, is, is rooted in Scripture. What we sing, what we say, how we worship God is rooted in, in theology. And so the doxologies themselves, if you've noticed, have had some deep um, theological doctrines. Uh, we've covered some really intense stuff, and we're going to cover some intense stuff today. But doxology and worship is rooted and grounded in theology. And I think, I hope I've been able to prove that so far. I hope this has been a blessing to your life. Um, reason upon reason upon reason, these doxologies have given us to praise God and to worship God. And today is no different. Uh, we'll give you more and more reason to praise God as we close this doxology. So we're going to be reading in Jude. We'll be focused on Jude 25, Jude 25. I'll still read the whole doxology though. And it says this, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Oh God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for this series and your word and these doxologies that really just created in us a heart of devotion and praise. And not only did it expand our love for you, but it expanded our knowledge of you. And God, we know that the deeper our knowledge of you, our, the deeper worship will experience. And we can't separate those two. And so, God, I pray that today would be no exception, that you would speak to us powerfully through your word, through these deep doctrinal um, issues and topics, but that it would create in us a heart of praise and adoration and worship and devotion to you. God, we love you. We pray that your spirit would illuminate the pages of scripture and that you would illuminate our heart and our minds to comprehend your word. God, speak to us and speak to us clearly and speak to us powerfully. In your mighty name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. This morning, what I want to do is I want to give you a few headings to help us grasp this text. The first heading is this, and again, reason upon, we're just going to, we're picking off where we left off last week, reason upon reason upon reason to praise God. And the first reason this morning is this, that we are to praise God, our Savior. Praise God, our Savior. In verse 25, Jude says, to the only God, our Savior. 
We are to praise God because he is a saving God. He's a saving God. You see, in Paul's day, uh, Zeus was actually called the great savior. Augustus was called the God and savior. But we know as Christians and we know from scripture that there's only one true savior and that's God himself. As a matter of fact, Jonah says in Jonah 2.9, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He is the only one who saves. He, he's the only one that can save. And salvation, all of salvation, belongs to him. I love what Pastor Paul, Pastor and missionary Paul Washer says about God, God's salvation. He says, God saved you for himself. God saved you by himself. And God saved you from himself. Let's break that down just a minute. God saved you for himself. What does that mean? That God saved you for his praise. In Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 6, look at this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. What's the purpose then? To the praise of his grace, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That God has chosen you and predestined you and adopted you for what? To the praise of his glory for himself. He gets the glory for saving you and I, believer. And not only does God save you for himself and for his glory, he saves you by himself. God doesn't need our help. God doesn't need our assistance. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. God saved you by himself. He didn't need any help. He's powerful enough to save the greatest of sinners. And lastly, God saved you from himself. This doesn't really get talked about much. God did not save you from loneliness, ultimately. God ultimately did not save you from purposelessness. God ultimately did not save you from financial ruin or a bad marriage or whatever it may be. God ultimately saved you from himself. Romans chapter 5 verse 9 says this, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We were saved from God's wrath. And so he is a saving God. And so here Jude praises God because he's a savior. And notice this, he says, our savior. It's such a personal thing. He just doesn't say the Savior, but our Savior, your Savior, if you're a believer. It's a personal thing. He's our Savior, and he deserves all the praise that we can give. So praise God because he is our Savior. Secondly, praise God for his majesty. Praise God for his majesty. Jude continues in verse 25. He says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty. We've already covered um, Jesus or God's glory. We're not going to cover that again. If you read all three doxologies, which we will in the end, you know there's a lot of overlap, so we're not covering the same, issue, the same issues over and over again. But God's glory, in a nutshell, is there's two ways to see it, just depending on the context. One, it's, it's God's radiant or brilliance. Uh, it, it is the result of God's uh, um, perfect attributes in being. And it's his, it's his light that shines forth from his perfection. The, where the second um, way that uh, glory is used is honor or praise to God. And I think actually here, Jude is using both of those. But again, we're not going to go there again. But I want to focus on the issue of majesty. What, what, does it, what does it mean that 
we should praise God for his majesty. You see, Jude is the only doxology in the New Testament that includes majesty, the majesty of God. And so the majesty of God is another way to really talk about his greatness, how great God is. I'll give you a verse in Psalm 93, verse 1 through 2. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength at his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And there's verse upon verse that talks about the greatness of God. And so the greatness of God and his majesty are really interchangeable. And so we have seen the greatness of God, even in the verse I just read, uh, read to you in Ephesians chapter 1, us being chosen in him, predestined in him, uh, adopted in him, just his greatness in all of salvation history and how he wanted to accomplish our redemption. I mean, what a great uh, uh, plan that God had to save sinners. One of the th- ways that I was reminded just recently, actually Friday, of God's greatness and majesty is his work in creation. To think about a God who created everything out of nothing. How great must this God be? On Friday, a few of us guys uh, from the church uh, had the bright idea to go hike the Grand Canyon in one day. And so um, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I did not think I was going to be here today. But as we were at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, all you could do is just look up and pray, God, help me get out of here. Um, But as we were going through the canyon, you just look up and you realize how small you are. And you realize how great God is in his creation, just his creation alone, how he's created the canyon so perfectly, the color, the water, the stars, everything, the trees, everything, that even the animals as we saw. And you just can't, I mean, you can't be down there and not think, man, there is a God who created this. And this God is great, and he's majestic, and he is worthy of our praise. But do we always think about God's greatness? Let me ask you a question. How often do you think of God's majesty? How often do you just sit back in your quiet time or wherever you're going and think and meditate and soak on the the majesty and the greatness of God? J.I. Packer in his famous book, Knowing God, says this. He says, we are modern people, and modern people, though they cherish great thoughts of themselves, have, as a rule, small thoughts of God. When the person in the church, let alone the person in the street, use the word God, the thought is rarely of divine majesty. Isn't that true? That when we think of ourselves, we think of ourselves as great, don't we? But very rarely do we think of God as great and majestic. And so I want to encourage you as we've been going through these reasons to praise God. Will you praise God for his greatness? Will you praise God for his majesty? Would you praise God for his greatness in your life in saving you and redeeming you and sending his son? Would you praise God for his greatness in creation? Or would you praise God in in his greatness in providing for you? Whatever it may be, believer, praise God for his majesty, for his greatness. Third reason we should praise God is praise God for his dominion. Praise God for his dominion. Now that's an interesting word, isn't it? Dominion. It's not something that we, it's not a word we use a lot. You see, the Greek word dominion simply means this, the power to direct or determine. That's what the Greek word means. It means the power to direct or determine. God's dominion or power 
really is talking about God's sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, how God's, God rules his creation in power. That's what we're talking about here. But I want to take it a step further. Because there's a difference between the sovereignty of God and God's providence. The sovereignty of God talks about God's power, right? God God rules everything and he has power. He has dominion over everything. But God's providence is part of his sovereignty in how God interacts with his creation. How God uses his power within creation. God's providence. I want to talk about that for a second. And normally, regularly, theologians dissect or structure God's providence, help us understand God's providence in three ways. First, by God's preservation. When we talk about God's sovereignty or God's providence, how God uses his power in creation, one way to think about it and one way that we we see Scripture uh, we see scripture um, you, uh, talk about God's power in creation is through preservation. And I have a definition for you. It says this, God keeps all created things existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. That's God's preservation. God preserves and keeps everything working like it should. This water bottle here does not crumble because God is preserving it. This watch on my wrist continues to operate as a watch because God is keeping it together. Now, let me back up, let me back this thought up with scripture. Nehemiah 9, 6 says, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts the earth and all, and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. God preserves creation. Specifically here, the earth, everything that's on it, the seas and all that is in them. God preserves them. Colossians 1.17 says, and he is before all things, and in him all things, not some things, all things hold together. And all things is a reference to all created things. So God holds together all of creation and preserves all of creation. Hebrews 1 verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God, Now we're talking about Jesus and the exact imprint of his nature. And notice this, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. The reason that the sun or the moon don't come crashing down is because Jesus has the power to uphold the entire universe. The word uphold means to carry or bear, and it's also in the Greek present tense, which means, uh, which, which signifies a continual action. So this indicates that Jesus is continually carrying and upholding all of creation the sun, the stars, the moon, the galaxies, the plant, everything, including you and I. He preserves everything. Most importantly, he preserves you and I. Job 34, 14, 15. If he should set his heart, God, to it and gather to himself his spirit and breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. If God would remove his breath from you, and stop sustaining you and I, we would perish. Every breath you take is God sustaining you and preserving you 
and holding you together. So God, in his sovereign power, preserves, sustains all of creation. And that's powerful. Isn't it, isn't it God who is able to do that worthy of our worship? Amen? The second way that God uses his power and his providence is this way. In his concurrence, theologians and scholars call it God's concurrence. There's a little bit of overlap, but there's also distinction between this and preservation. But it it means this, that God cooperates. That's the key word there. God cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. Keyword here is cooperates. God cooperates with his creation to direct his creation, to act as they normally would. Usually also theologians would talk about a primary cause and a secondary cause uh, with everything that happens in our world. God is always the primary cause and nature or humans or his creation is always the secondary cause. Let me get specific with you. I want to first talk about creation in general. Job 37, verse 6, and then 10 through 13 says this. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise, to the downpour, his mighty downpour. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world. Whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Psalm 135, 7. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth who makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouse. The secondary cause of hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning, rain, could be scientifically thought about. And well, if, if, if there's a, I'm, I'm just making it up now, I only watch the news, but if there's a, a high wind here and there's low pressure, I mean, what, however it works, I'm not a meteorologist, Uh, They didn't offer that class in seminary. But there's a natural way to explain it, right? Hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning and rain. There's a natural way to explain it, secondary cause. There's also a primary cause. Scripture here clearly says that it's God that causes those things. So we see God cooperating with creation. Let me give you another example. Ask a question. Who feeds the animals on the earth? Do they feed themselves or does God feed them? Let's find out. Matthew, Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Sure, birds go and look for food, don't they? Any animal goes and looks for food, but ultimately, who feeds them? God, the primary cause. Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Notice this, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Not one bird, not one sparrow will fall to its death unless God has determined for it to happen. Primary cause and a secondary cause. What about random random events? Proverbs 16.33 The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. 
Dice, in other words, modern day dice. You can roll the dice, but who determines the decision? God. Primary cause. Most importantly, what about our what about us? What about us? What about humans? What about our actions? Jeremiah 10, 23 says, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Similarly, Proverbs 16, 9 says, the heart of man plans his ways, but who determines it? Who establishes man's ways? But the Lord establishes his steps. Man plans his ways, desires to do things, but who ultimately determines our steps or establishes our actions? God himself. I love what R.C. Sproul says. He's already passed away, but he says this. If there is one single molecule in this universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. In other words, there's no such thing as a random maverick molecule in this earth. There's no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as randomness. There's no such thing outside of God's sovereignty, outside of his will, and outside of his providence. From creation to animals to random events to our own actions, there's a secondary cause and a primary cause. That's what Jude is talking about here. But we, we just skip the word dominion like dominion. But there's more to it. The third way that theologians talk about God's power and sovereignty and providence is his governance. God has a purpose in all that he does in the world. And he providentially governs or directs all things in order that they accomplish his purposes. God has a purpose in this world. And God is sovereignly directing all things, all of creation, including you and I, to the very end of the purpose that God has for this, this world and for our lives. Ephesians 1.11 says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works, what? Who works all things. Not just some things. Who works all all things according to the counsel of his will. God is working out all things in this world, in our lives, for the purpose that he has already predestined and determined before the foundation of the world. There's a tension here, isn't there? There's a tension. And here are the two main questions that come up with this tension. Johnny, what about free will? If God is the primary one who directs all things, does that mean I don't have free will? What about my free will? Doesn't it matter? I believe that God could be sovereign over all things, but at the same time, give us free will. And by the way, this is a whole nother sermon, but by free will, I mean this. Free will, biblical free will, is our desire or our ability to do whatever, uh, to do whatever we would want um, in regards to our nature, our, our nature. Our, our nature, whether we're in Christ or in Adam, really controls our actions. That's how the Bible talks about free will, that we desire or we do, we do what we desire to do most. 
And if you're in Adam, you desire to sin most and do evil most. If you're in Christ, you desire to do good. That's how we talk about free will. But that's for another day. Actually, that's for Romans 9 and 10. So do we have free will? Let me ask you this, especially if you know the scriptures pretty well. Who sent Joseph into slavery? Remember his, his, uh, his brothers were a little jealous of Joseph and they sold him into slavery and Joseph ended up in Egypt. Do you remember that? Who sold him into slavery? Who led him there? Well, I think it was both. It was both. In Genesis chapter 45, it says this. And now do not be, it's not going to be on the screen, but, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And in verse 7, It says, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Who sent Joseph? God. Who also sent Joseph? Freely out of their free will. Who sold Joseph into slavery? His brothers. His brothers. As a matter of fact, Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 says this, as for you, you meant it, you meant evil against me. You meant evil against me. You meant to sell me to slavery. But notice what he says, but God meant it for good. You have here in this situation, Joseph's brothers in their free will selling him but God being the primary or ultimate cause, sending him as well. Let me ask you a question, another question. Who crucified Christ? Who crucified Christ? In Acts chapter 2, this won't be on your screen, but as Peter's preaching his sermon in Pentecost, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, listen to this, this Jesus delivered up or crucified, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of God of lawless men. God planned it, and man in their free will crucified Christ. There's a very similar passage in Acts chapter 4, verse 27. It says this, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod Uh, and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Look at this. To do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. Once again, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentile, the people of Israel who crucified Christ, but it was predestined by God. So do we have free will? Yes your actions have real consequences. You have the ability to make choices that have good consequences or bad consequences. Yes, you have free will, but at the same time, God is ultimately sovereign. I like to think of it as two train tracks. On one track, you have man's free will. On the second track, you have God's sovereignty, and they never cross. And so that's what Jude is talking about here. The power, the dominion, the sovereignty of God. 
the sovereignty of God is something he should be praised for. But many times when we think of God's sovereignty, we're like, oh, that's too tricky for me. I don't want to think about tough things about man's free will and God's sovereignty. I'm just going to not think about that. But here, Judah is saying it's a reason to praise God. The other question that comes up is, what about evil then? What about evil? What about the hurricane that just happened? What about murders? What about all that? Is God responsible for that? In Scripture, God is never accused of sinning or of evil. So no. God can determine it and predetermine everything, but ultimately the people who are responsible of those evil crimes or sins is humanity itself. But no, you can't give me one verse in Scripture that says that God does evil or that God sins. There's tension. And sometimes as as, as Christians, we have to be okay with the tension. And I'm okay with the tension. I love what John Calvin says about this very issue, actually. He says this. For our wisdom ought not to be nothing else than to embrace with humble teachableness and at least without finding fault whatever is taught in sacred scripture. In other words, let me put it this way, what John Calvin is saying, he's saying, the problem is not with scripture. The problem is with us. We are finite in our thinking. And we must approach scripture and especially these tough doctrines with humility and teachableness knowing that we're finite creatures trying to understand, comprehend, and worship an infinite God. So church, I'm not sure if you've ever praised God for his sovereignty, but praise him for his sovereignty. Praise him for his power. Praise him for his preservation of all things. Praise him for working in your life in a powerful way. Praise God that there is no such thing as chance or luck. Next, fourth reason to praise God. Praise God for his authority. Praise God for his authority. That's what Jude tells us there. Majesty and authority. Authority. Again, Jude, uh, Jude is the only doxology in the New Testament that praises him for his authority. Now, what's the difference between God's authority and God's sovereignty or God's power? I like to put it this way. What good would an officer be if he didn't have authority? If an officer was given his badge and his pistol and his uniform and his cop car without any authority, He wouldn't be able to do anything, right? So God not only has the power to do as he pleases, but he also has the authority to do as he pleases as well, to use his power, his sovereign, omnipotent power, however he wants. Daniel 4, 35 says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can say, no one can say, stay, I'm sorry, and no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one can tell God, what have you done? Why are you doing it, doing it this way? No one can tell God that. What have you done, God? God could do whatever he wants. Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. 
in Romans chapter 9, 19 through 21, talking about sovereign election, he says, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its smolder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? In other words, what Paul is arguing here is we can't say, God, why have you decided to elect some and pass over others? Who are we to tell the potter what to do? God has the authority to do whatever he desires to do. And again, another tough doctrine. But Jude doesn't shy away. He says, praise God for his authority. Praise God that he's able to do whatever he does and whatever he wants to do in perfect wisdom, as we've covered previously. Notice the fifth reason to praise God as we conclude here. Praise God for his immutability. Praise God for his immutability. Jude says that, you know, glory and majesty and dominion and authority be before all time and now and forever. Amen. God is to be glorified forever. God has just been praised for his glory majesty and dominion and authority, all of these amazing and powerful attributes. But I want you to notice here that it's, it's so important. Again, we read the Bible way too fast. There's a deep theological truth here because God is being glorified and praised before all time, now and forever. God is being praised for his glory, majesty, authority, dominion, all, everything before all time. So God did not become more glorious or more majestic at some point in history. God did not become the sovereign ruler of all things at some point in history. God was not given this authority to rule at some point in history. God already had all authority. God already had all power before. God was being glorified perfectly before all time. God did not acquire these attributes that Jude praises him for. He was the glorious, majestic, sovereign ruler in eternity past. He is now and he will always be. Let me put it this way. What God was before time, he is in time and will be for all time. God doesn't change. There is no becoming in God. God doesn't change. This is the doctrine of God's immutability. Psalm 102, 25 and 27 says this, of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will, wear, they will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away but you are the same and your years have no end. When we look at the world, we think, man, the world's going to be here forever. The earth is going to be here forever. No, it's going to pass away and it's changing, but God doesn't change. Not only does God not change in his being and his nature, God doesn't change in his purpose or plans. Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever the plans of his heart to all generations. God doesn't change his plans mid-salvation history. So God's being doesn't change. His attributes doesn't change, don't change. Uh, his, His purpose doesn't change. And his promises don't change either. Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said And will he not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not fulfill it? His promises, 
If God said it, he will do it. He will fulfill it. So there's no becoming in God. Jude praises God for these attributes that he had before all time. He he already had them. So God doesn't change in his being or character. He doesn't change his purposes, and he doesn't change his promises. The Dutch Reformed theologian, Herman Boving, puts it this way. The doctrine of God's immutability is of the highest significance for religion. The contrast between being and becoming marks the difference between the creator and the creature. That's the difference between a creator and a creature, being and becoming. Every creature is continually becoming. We're changing. It is changeable, constantly striving, seeks rest and satisfaction, and finds this rest in God, in him alone. For only he is pure being and no becoming. I love that. God is pure being and no becoming. Hence, in scripture, God is often called the rock. Now you might be thinking again, what's up with all this theology? What does it have to do with me? Especially God's immutability. It has everything to do with you. You see, because if God could change in his being, it would mean that God could become a better God and we wouldn't have the best version of God now or that in the future God could become a worse God or an evil God. If God could change in his purpose, especially in his purpose of salvation, that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to save sinners, and you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone? If God could change in his purpose and say, you know what, this whole thing about salvation by faith, I changed my mind. How about you start trying to earn your salvation? I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to change my purpose. Can you imagine? What if God could change when it comes to his promises? Is he a God to be trusted? This matters. This matters a lot. But God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God to be trusted. Praise God for his immutability. Praise God for his authority that he has the power to do as he pleases. And if you miss the sermon on God's wisdom, God has perfect wisdom. So he uses his power and authority perfectly. Praise God for his dominion, for his majesty. Praise God because he's savior. Reason upon reason upon reason to praise God. There's no better way to end than to think, read these doxologies together one last time. Will you stand with me? And as you stand, I just want to encourage you briefly to do two things based off the two goals we had. To passionately pursue the study of the word of God. Be a student of the word. Every Christian is a theologian. Study the word of God. Why? So you can be smarter? No. Because God is worthy of praise. The more you know God, the more you know his word, the more you know who God is, the deeper your worship will be. He is looking for worshipers in spirit and truth. Both. And secondly, Passionately pursue the worship of God both privately and corporately. May you live a life of praise on your own, in your devotional time, on your way to work, wherever you're at, praising God for who he is, his attributes, and for what he's done in his actions. Let's read the doxologies. I'll read them to you. Will you just close your eyes as I read these to you? And I'll pray. 
Romans 16, 25, 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And lastly, our Jude passage. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God, we love you. We thank you. We worship you and we praise you. You're worthy of all of our praise. For your grace, as we cover through these three doxologies, your grace, your provision, the way you establish us, the way you keep us saved in you and in your hand, and on and on and on. God, we just praise you. No one is worthy of our praise like you are. And so, God, I pray that as we move forward in our lives, we just live a life of praise, of worship, and adoration that our study of your word would lead us to a life of worship and devotion, that you would raise our affections to you. And as we worship you and love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, may we go back to your word to know you even deeper. And as we know you deeper, we worship you deeper, and it's just a beauty, uh, this, this cycle of beauty of theology and doxology. And God, for you, to you, to you, be all glory forever and ever. And one day, we will stand before you face to face, worshiping you, glorifying you without the presence of sin. And we'll stand before your glory. And we cannot wait for that, God. We love you. We worship you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.